This is a Reconstructionist radio production. Please visit ChristendomRestored.com to read this article along with many more. The title of this article is Putting the Claim that Theonomy is Like Sharia to Presuppositional Rest, Part 1, written by Bojidar Marinov, March 12, 2015. Theological opposition to theonomy keeps evolving. Those of us who have been in the debate for the last two decades can clearly see it. Those older than us, the veterans, who have been in it for over four decades, see it even more clearly. First, it was the dispensationalist argument that we are in the dispensation of grace, not of the law, and therefore the law of God is not applicable to us today. Dispensationalism collapsed under its own weight of foolishly but consistently given its theology giving its followers promises that couldn't come true. Then the faculties of Westminster East and West decided to take theonomy to task by the rhetorical device of the law versus grace distinction, applied in an openly unbiblical way and without any clue as to what theonomy teaches. The resulting Theonomy, a Reformed Critique, 1990, was such a blatant disaster and received such a blow by theonomy and informed response, 1991, that the two seminaries are still ashamed of that book and don't bother to republish it. Then, in the mid-90s, the Lutheran concept of two kingdoms was recovered from its ashes of the 1930s when it fell in disgrace, being used by Hitler to subject the German churches to his regime. By the 1990s, to the average churchgoer in the U.S., Nazi Germany was as distant as the Battle of Naboo. So a few Westminster West professors took it, dusted it off, warmed it up a little bit, and inflated it under the name of Two Kingdoms Theology. Real theology it never became, for no one really wrote a systematic defense of it, only a small book by Van Drunen, and several articles and haphazard mentions of the term in articles and interviews. It remained only a rhetoric, a semantical device to reject theonomy. It never rose up to the task of presenting a consistent, comprehensive worldview as an alternative to theonomy, which by that time had developed consistent theory about almost every major area of the life of man and his institutions. All these proved inadequate to combat theonomy, so they had to be dropped at some point. The two kingdoms rhetoric is also falling in disrepute of what I see, for it can hardly win the hearts of many by its insisting that, quote, God doesn't redeem the civil institutions, he only preserves them, end quote, from Van Drunen's book, Living in God's Two Kingdoms. Over the years, the opponents of theonomy, ironically, have been moving closer and closer to theonomy, despite their professed disagreement with it, while theonomists have become even more consistent with their teaching. Opposition started in the 1970s with, quote, The law is not for today, we are under grace, end quote. In the 1990s, it was, quote, the moral law is valid, but only for the church. The common kingdom is under the natural law, end quote. About a decade ago, natural law was defined already as, quote, the moral law of God written on the hearts of men, end quote. And in our day, as the debate between Joel McDermott and Jordan Hall demonstrated, the opponents of theonomy have moved so close to theonomy that they now bicker over whether the civil laws are obligatory or practical, while the justice of the law for today is accepted for granted. Forty years ago, these were discussions between theonomists. In fact, these were some of the discussions on the ICE Forum just twenty years ago. Now, as theonomists have become more consistent, anti-theonomists have adopted the position of the former moderate theonomists. We can safely extrapolate where this is going. This gradual surrender to theonomy, however, has to be disguised somehow in order for the critics to keep face, so the same old tactics is used of false statements, misrepresentations, fabricated quotes, or quotes out of context, etc. The McDermott-Hall debate I mentioned above was full of those, and Joe McDermott has documented many of them here. See link at christendomrestored.com. In addition to those, we have the good old technique of base rhetoric and false analogies. Theonomy has been compared to both anarchy and fascism at the same time, and sometimes by the same authors, and sometimes within the same article, 
No kidding. Recently, however, with the hype about the rising danger of Islam in the secular media, another false analogy has become the fad of the day for anti-theonomists. Theonomy is like Sharia. Spiffy, hey? No need to explain your position. No need to explain theonomy. Actually, no need to study theonomy at all. Just use the impression of those images in the media of decapitated prisoners to create the emotion, and then direct the emotion against theonomy. Why bother actually studying theonomy? This is exactly what James White of Alpha and Omega Ministries did in this video. See the link at ChristendomRestored.com. I have heard of White before, from friends of mine who have praised him highly for his presuppositionalism in his debates, which presuppositionalism I couldn't detect in this particular video, by the way. My friends also praised him for his deep knowledge of Islam, and consequently for his debates with Muslim scholars. I can't pass judgment on the validity of his ministry, and I'm not going to indulge in the childish play of some ministry leaders in the U.S. of comparing personas and ministries. Quote, My ministry has been around for 32 years, and I have 25 books published. Show me your ministry and your publications. End quote. I am perfectly satisfied if my persona and my ministry are considered inferior to everyone else's. My place in God's kingdom is mine only, and I don't need comparisons to feel secure in what I do and who I am. If there are debates within the Christian community, I believe they should be on theology, not on personal merits. A true minister of God should be the first to agree with those who assault him personally or just ignore their, tactic, their attacks, and at the same vehemently and vigorously defend and proclaim what he believes. I must say, though, I was rather disappointed of what I heard. There were quite a few statements by White in that video that rather disproved the notion that he was the expert so highly praised by my friends. Without going into too much detail, the main disappointment was in the area of presuppositionalism. At some point in the video, in his comments on theonomy, White went on to defend the excluded middle ground, and declare his position to be that middle ground. Obviously, when it comes to ethical judicial issues, biblical presuppositionalism doesn't allow for a middle ground. Its battle cry has always been, push the antithesis. No matter what brand of presuppositionalist one is, Clarkian or Vantillian, there is no way to imagine Vantill or Clark or John Robbins or Greg Bonson or any other presuppositionalist arguing for a middle ground, ethically, judicially. This is a major blunder for one who claims to be a presuppositionalist. White either doesn't have a clue what presuppositionalism is, or he doesn't care to employ it in his thinking. Another area of disappointment was intellectual honesty. White doesn't know much about theonomy. He calls it a movable target, when, in reality, theonomy is the best published theological position as of present, and therefore there is nothing movable about it. There is more material for theonomy available than for all of the alternative positions combined. He also claims that there are substantial differences between some major voices of theonomy, but there is no evidence for such substantial differences. In fact, if anything, the theonomists are the most united group of all groups in terms of theological beliefs. Their substantial differences among amount to arguments over the validity and forms of public taxation, or over the nature and the place of the church. In comparison, to give an example, the Southern Baptists in the United States are still divided over the issue of God's sovereignty and predestination, for crying out loud. And yet, for all his ignorance about theonomy, White scorns the objections of theonomists that he misrepresents theonomy, and says that he will not invest the time to study what he criticizes. He repeats that several times, to make sure his listeners got the message. White's moral failure aside, what is more important is his use of the same base rhetoric and false analogy I mentioned above. Theonomy is like Sharia. In the video, while criticizing some theonomists and explaining his differences with, him, with them, he says, quote, Because of Acts chapter 15, we don't have to bring Sharia, but Islam has to. End quote. So there it is. He is arguing against theonomists. He is then invoking his expertise on Islam. Then, within the same argument of counterposing theonomy to his position, which is so unspecified that only Allah knows what it is, I might guess, he freely moves to a counterposition of his position to Sharia. Logically, 
there is no way to claim he hasn't used the rhetoric. If, in the same argument, his opposition to theonomy is explained using the analogy of his opposition to Sharia, then he is comparing theonomy to Sharia. It is this false analogy that needs to be put to a presuppositional rest. And this is what this article is about. Hopefully, White will read it and will humble himself and repent for his slander against theonomy. In the process, I will have to teach him a thing or two about presuppositionalism. I will also have to teach him a thing or two about Islam, from a presuppositional perspective, I mean. And most important, I will use this as an occasion to give an example to the readers of how presuppositionalism should be properly applied to law and religion. Now don't get me wrong. I am not saying that White doesn't know facts about Islam. I am sure anyone who focuses on a specific area can learn a bunch of facts within a three-month period, with today's availability of printed and electronic material. And since he has focused on Islam, he certainly knows more facts about it than most of us, enough to impress us all. But for a true presuppositionalist, facts do not speak of themselves. One needs to have the right presuppositional understanding, and his comparison of theonomy with Sharia is a proof he has not built a presuppositional understanding of Islam. Therefore, while he may know many facts about Islam, he doesn't have a true knowledge of it. This is what this article will make the effort to do. Help him understand the presuppositional nature of the facts that he has learned. So is theonomy like Sharia law? Let's get started. The Nature of God and the Nature of Revelation A presuppositionalist must always approach every analysis, every analogy, every policy recommendation starting from, well, the basic presuppositions, of course. He can't afford to rely on superficial and trivial arguments. To remain faithful to his position, a presuppositionalist must examine every idea down to its deepest philosophical foundations, to the level of its basic commitments or assumptions. Without such examination, there can be no real logic, no real analysis, no real debate, because there would be no real interpretation of facts. And without interpretation of facts, facts remain silent. Therefore, a comparative analysis between Sharia and theonomy must, if it is to be done within a presuppositionalist framework, go back to the very foundational question of both systems, a question that is ultimately an issue of faith. What is the nature of the God behind each system? A commentator who, like White, simply makes a superficial statement of comparison without first going so far back, is no different than a media propagandist who just relies on Pavlov-type instincts in his listeners. He has committed the same logical fallacy as the atheist who claims that the early Christians were communists because they shared everything freely. Superficial resemblance is not true identity, and a true presuppositionalist knows it, and knows to avoid foolish comparisons. So let's get to a comparative analysis of the natures of the gods behind both systems. It is generally assumed that, both being theistic religions, Christianity and Islam have similar views of the nature of God. In fact, most misunderstandings between the two religions come from this assumption. On the Christian side, many Christians vehemently deny, rightfully, that Jehovah is Allah. But they see the differences mainly in the fact that Jehovah is a loving God while Allah is a vengeful, bloody God. Wrong. On the Muslim side, Muslims are positive that Jehovah and Allah are the same God, but they see in Christianity a mild form of polytheism, having three gods rather than one. Other than the ethical nature of God and the arithmetic of his persons, most people can't see a deeper difference. The difference, however, is much deeper. It is an ontological difference having to do with the very nature of God as He is. It goes to the original question of any cosmology. Is God, and therefore reality, ultimately one or many? And then to the question that is essentially the same as the first one. Is God ultimately transcendent or immanent? Translated in layman's terms, the question means, is God ultimately remote, separated from the reality of facts and experience, transcendent, or is he intimately present in that reality and every part of it, imminent? Related to this question about the nature of God are almost all other questions and problems of our knowledge and interpretation of ourselves and the world. What we believe about logic, science, technology, 
society, economics, law, time, man, family, etc., will ultimately hinge on the answers we give to these questions about the nature of God. It is here where the most fundamental difference between Christianity and all other religions, including Judaism and Islam, lies. While every religion and philosophy tries to solve the problem in favor of either unity or plurality, either transcendence or immanence, Christianity asserts a God who, in himself, contains without contradiction the equal ultimacy of the one and the many. Is he one or is he many? Our answer is yes. Neither has greater ultimacy in him. And this oneness and manyness of God are not simply connected in him in some sort of dialectical cohabitation. God doesn't simply reconcile unity and plurality in himself. They are both integral, integral characteristics of his very being. Following from that, and even more relevant to our discussion, Christianity believes that both transcendence and immanence are ultimate in God's nature. God is ultimately transcendent. He is perfectly distinct from his creation, absolute, self-existent, and self-sufficient, and in no way can be said to be dependent on or identified with his creation or with any part of it. At the same time, God is ultimately imminent. He is intimately present with and involved in every single detail and part of reality. It is on this premise that the central doctrine of the New Testament is based, the Incarnation. Through the Incarnation, God made himself manifest to his creation in a way that is sovereign and divine, and yet accessible to every creature to taste, see, touch, and experience. God's equally ultimate transcendence and imminence are the doctrine which gives meaning and basis for the entry of Jesus Christ in the universe. Hebrews 1, 5-6 God can be one God, and yet He can beget a Son from eternity, who will be His perfect representation in His creation. This belief about the nature of God is the underlying theological reason for the insistence on the person of Jesus Christ as a test for Christian orthodoxy. Quote, Acknowledged in two natures, unconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the difference of the nature's being in no way removed because of the union, but rather the properties of each nature being preserved, and both concurring into one person and one hypostasis, not as though he were parted or divided into two persons, but one and the self-same Son, and only begotten God, Word, Lord, Jesus Christ. End quote. Chalcedonian Creed. The importance of this definition for orthodoxy is in the fact that it is not just a nominal proposition. The nature of Christ is the pivot of the Christian faith. In Christ we see God the way we can't see Him directly. God is revealed in Christ, and in Christ even His divine nature is revealed to us, in all the glory that our eyes can bear to see. Christ has in His person both the transcendence and the eminence of the Father, both the absoluteness and the concreteness of God's relation to the world. He reveals that God is not restricted to his heavenly realm, unable to relate in a meaningful way to his creatures. To the contrary, God can become like his creatures and share their created nature and be above his creation and yet in his creation, distinct from his creatures and yet fully like them. In opposition to the Trinitarianism of Christianity, God is ultimately one in many, stands the most fundamental doctrine of Islam, Tawhid, or the oneness of Allah. Allah is one. Muslim scholars insist when the word one is used for Allah. It is a not a number, for then it would sound as if he is one of many. One, when used for Allah, is an expression of nature, both internal and comparative. He is one. There are no parts in him, but also he is single, as in compared to no other. So far there is nothing that Christianity would disagree with, but then comes the negative aspect of Tawhid. Allah's oneness is his ultimate description of his nature, and therefore he can't be said to be many in any sense of this word. There is no distinction in him in any possible sense. Thus the Christian distinction between the persons of the Trinity sounds idolatrous to a Muslim, for it is by definition shirk, that is, idolatry or polytheism, 
the opposite to, ha- to Tawheed. Allah is such a strict unity that even his 99 names, upon which not all Muslim scholars agree, must be considered one name, describing one nature. A large part of Islamic apologetics is devoted to proving the unity of Allah. The awareness of his unity is a spiritual requirement, and Muslim evangelization is simple. Testify that Allah is one. With a God who has such uncompromising unity to the exclusion of any identification or distinction, the Muslim creed can't but be very simple. Allah is one. Thus, even people in history before Muhammad who have never heard of Islam are considered good Muslims if they have acknowledged in a simple way that God is one. Abraham, for example. The OT and the Gospel are thus Muslim holy books for the same reason, but according to the Quran, they were corrupted. The more relevant part of our analysis comes when we move to the logical conclusions from the oneness of Allah to His relation to the world. Obviously, Allah, who is perfectly one and never many, can't be present in any meaningful, real sense in His creation. The creation is always, by definition, subject to fragmentation, and therefore the presence of Allah in any particular part of it would subject Him to fragmentation. This leads us to a very important conclusion about the nature of Allah. He can't share His character and His attributes with His creation. The creation is not a true revelation of Allah in any meaningful way. He cannot contain any of the attributes of Allah. Unlike the Christian God, Allah has no communicable attributes. He is loving and merciful, but He doesn't share His love and mercy with His creatures. Whatever love and mercy they show must be radically different from His. Same with His patience and knowledge and wisdom and any other trait of His character. His character is His only and will remain His only. And indeed, an integral part of the doctrine of Tawheed is the concept of shirk, which as a term can be translated idolatry or polytheism, but etymologically means sharing. It is an unpardonable sin in Islam to allow the notion that Allah can share His character or His attributes with anyone. Shirk can be of many types, but important for us here are two. 1. Allah is given the qualities of humans or animals, as in the Lord's hand. And 2. Allah's qualities are associated or imputed to creatures. So not only saying that God is three persons is idolatry for a Muslim, but also saying that we are showing God's love, patience, or mercy would be idolatrous. This distant Allah, isolated and separated from His creation, can never produce any sons and daughters. When it comes to the issue of sons of God, the Quran itself clearly connects Allah's oneness to the impossibility of Him having any offspring that would bear His image or nature, in one of its shortest surahs, chapters. al Kalas Say He is Allah, one, Allah the Everlasting. He never begets, nor is begotten, and no one is equal to Him. Similarly to the Jews in Jesus' time, John 10.36, the Quran declares that Allah's oneness prevents him from having sons. Indeed, the Christian creed of Jesus Christ being the only begotten Son of God is especially offensive to Muslims. It seems to violate the name of God by drawing God in a contact with His creation, which is a profanation of His divine nature. Thus, theoretically, both Christianity and Islam affirm a creator-creation distinction where creatures can't rise to the level of God and become divine. But the fundamental difference is in the nature of God and His ability to cross the dividing line and become like His creatures. To make it simple, we can use the analogy of the center line of the road. For Christianity, the line will be solid on the side of the creature and dashed on the side of God. That is, creatures can never cross the line to achieve divinity, but God can cross it at will, and He did. For Islam, on the other hand, the center line will be double solid, for neither Allah nor the creature can cross the line without losing ontological or ethical integrity. From being to revelation. Our presuppositions about the ontology, that is, the being of God, will by necessity have bearing on our view of the nature of God's revelation. 
Revelation, obviously, is a necessary condition if a God is to be relevant. After all, a God who doesn't reveal himself to man is as good as a God who doesn't exist at all, from man's perspective. What is man supposed to do with an unknown and unknowable God? How is he to worship such a God? Is he to worship him at all? Could it be that such a God wants to be dishonored or opposed? You never know, after all, what could be pleasing to an unknown God. Therefore, a real God is only that God that wills to reveal himself to man. Any other deity will be irrelevant, and a worship of such deity would be really a worship of man's imagination. But will to reveal himself is not enough. That God must also have the capability to reveal himself to man. Such capability will depend on the nature of such a God, and on the nature of his relation to reality in general and man in particular. If such a God is too deeply immersed in reality, ultimate manyness and imminence, to be identified with it, he would struggle to distinguish himself from reality when it comes to revelation. After all, if God is to be identified with the material universe, then there is really no difference between knowing God and knowing the material universe. Then there is no real revelation, as in uncovering things previously hidden. On the other hand, if that God is too distant from reality, ultimate oneness and transcendence, his attempts to reveal himself may fail because man will have no way to relate meaningfully to such a God, not having any shared ground of knowledge with him. Again, then, man will have to resort to his imagination, at least in interpreting the revelation. The presuppositionalist, then, is not only interested in what the nature of the God behind his system of thought is, he needs to discover how the nature of that God defines and conditions the revelation that God gives. Is it a revelation that really reveals anything hidden, anything of value? Does it set God apart from the rest of reality? Does it bridge the gap between human and divine, giving man a real opportunity to know God, etc., etc.? A God whose nature prevents him from delivering meaningful revelation to man is no better than a God who is silent, and therefore is no better than no God at all. For all practical purposes, the choice before us is between meaningful revelation and practical atheism. The Bible is full of statements of God's meaningful, reliable, intimate revelation to man, revelation not just of the created real reality, but of God himself. In Hebrews chapter 1, God, who is described as the Majesty on High, verse 3, has also been revealing Himself in history, first partially through the prophets, verse 1, and now fully through the Son, verse 2, who is the imprint, that is, the exact representation of His nature, verse 3. The Son is begotten by God, verse 5, and therefore He is also God Himself, verse 8. He is not a creature, for His real abode is outside the world with God, verses 3 and 6, and he is also creator himself, verse 10, and eternal, verses 11 and 12. And yet, he is introduced into the world, verse 6, being himself a revelation of God. Thus, God's oneness and manyness, God's transcendence and imminence, and Christ's double nature, divine and creature-like, are combined to declare that God has delivered a full, reliable, and practical revelation of himself to man. Being one transcendent God, God's divinity, incomprehensibility, and absoluteness are preserved. Quote, no one has ever seen God. End quote. Being a trinity, intimately pres present in his creation, he is manifested through the second person. Quote, the only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has revealed him. End quote. John 1.18 that such an awesome God would choose to reveal himself in such accessible and knowable and intimate way is a stunning proposition, and we are often unable to grasp what we are seeing with our own eyes. John 14, 7-10 The Incarnation was the one unique act that made that possible, and the Incarnation itself was possible because of the nature of God. But the process of God revealing himself doesn't stop with one central, historical act. The Incarnation is only the beginning because it made it possible for countless smaller incarnations. God and Christ, through the Holy Spirit, make their abode with everyone who believes, John 14, 23. God's revelation is not limited to intellectual knowledge of God. It works out into embodying God's moral character in God's people. The majesty on high, the God who abides in inaccessible light, 1 Timothy 6, 16. 
not only can share his character with his creatures, he actively works to embody it in them. Note carefully that Christ, the revealed God, is also called the Word, speaks volumes of the nature of God's revelation. When we open the Word of Revelation, we see Christ in it. When we look at Christ, we are looking at God. And this is not a New Testament doctrine only, opposed to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God did appear to people in human form many times. He did talk to His creatures, and He did share His character with them. He took special care to indicate to His people that He was very close to them, and that the knowledge of Him was perfectly accessible. Deuteronomy 30, 11-14 God was still unseen and invisible, as He told Moses. Exodus 33, 17-23 But He was talking personally to Moses, as He was passing in all His glory. With Elijah, the passing of God was described in detail by wonders, wind, earthquake, fire, and yet, God wasn't in any of them. He was in the voice of gentle blowing, 1 Kings 19, which examined Elijah's motives and revealed God's intentions and will. There are many more examples. God talked to men, walked with men, ate with men, wrestled with men, and revealed himself to men on men's terms. And at the same time, he was the great I Am who needs nothing and depends on nothing. It is rather humorous when atheists try to make the argument that the God of the Bible can't possibly be real since He is revealed in primarily in anthropomorphic terms. The answer to this is, well, duh, that's what He said He was going to do, for He created man in His image. We have a unique God. He can be God, and yet He can take on human body and characteristics and still remain God. He can be incomprehensible, and inaccessible, and yet he can reveal himself to man too closely as his closest friend. In sharp contrast to the God of the Bible is Allah of the Quran. Not only does he, he reveal himself, but asking him to reveal himself may have dire consequences. The most glaring example of the Quran's view of Allah's revelation is Al-Araf 7, 143, where Muhammad gives his twisted version of Exodus 33, 18-23, mixing in elements of Elijah's experience in 1 Kings 19, 11-13. Quote, And when Moses arrived at our appointed time and his Lord spoke to him, he said, My Lord, show me yourself, that I may look at you. Allah said, You will not see me, but look at the mountain. If it should remain in place, then you will see me. And when his Lord appeared to the mountain, he rendered it level. And Moses fell unconscious. And when he awoke, he said, Exalted are you, I have repented to you, and I am the first of the, of the believers. Quote, end quote. Notice, the very request to see Allah is sinful enough to require repentance. So he reduces a mountain to dust and renders Moses unconscious in the process to make his point. A Christian who is carefully reading the Quran will stop here and ask the question, Why unconscious? The Bible doesn't have a single example of a person who encounters God and falls unconscious, losing his senses. Neither does the Bible contain an example of someone who wanted to see God or know God and had to repent for it later. God always responds positively to the desire of His creatures to see Him and know Him. The knowledge of God is a basic aspect of Christian piety, 1 John 4, 8. And not knowing God is sin. 1 Thessalonians 4, 5, and 2, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8. But for a Muslim, such desire to see Allah and to know Him personally would mean that either man will have to be elevated to divine status or that Allah will have to be demoted to the status of creature. Neither is possible, and even the simplest attempt can't help but end up in some form of destruction. Allah destroys a whole mountain, and Moses loses his conscience. The central line must remain double solid, and it can never be crossed from either side. The previous surah, Al-Anam, lists the numerous ways in which Allah supposedly has revealed His existence to the unbelievers. The signs He lists are taken from the Bible, but they never personally involve Allah. Physical phenomena and natural disasters, sending prophets and angels, historical curses and blessings, etc., Nowhere does Allah point to or promise any personal appearance similar to the biblical Emmanuel, God with us. The faith in Him is supposed to remain blind faith, one that is not supported by Allah's personal and unmistakable intervention in history. 
Believers may know that Allah exists, but they can't know Him personally. Unbelievers will never be faced with any fact about Allah in history that is personal, special, compelling, unique, and close to the heart and mind of man. There is no incarnation, whether special, as in Jesus Christ, or general, as in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Faith remains entirely an exercise of the human will, and that in a universe which is entirely predetermined, which makes the human will rather obsolete for all practical purposes. That Allah's knowledge and Allah's mind are entirely impossible for humans to grasp or know or follow is additionally attested by an element of the Qur'an which is rather curious for Christians. The mystery verses, or Mukata Atta, abbreviations. In the Qur'an, 29 surahs start with combinations of letters which make no sense whatsoever in Arabic. For a Christian whose God not only gladly reveals himself to his children, but has intended to do so as the very essence of his redemption of the world, Jeremiah 31:34 and Hebrews 8:11. Adding such mysteries to a holy book makes no sense whatsoever. But for a Muslim who always expects his encounter with Allah to lead to some form of unconsciousness, as in the example above with Moses, they are perfectly natural and expected. Muslim scholars are not in agreement on the meaning of the abbreviations. Opinions range from the pious mysteries which only Allah knows to the more rationalistic and cultural, poetic technique inherited from the pre-Muslim Arabic cultures. It seems that the majority of scholars, though, tend towards the opinion that the abbreviations have to do with the attributes of Allah, or some expression of His character. Arabic and Assyrian Christian commentators also believe that these mysteries combinations of letters point to the character of Allah. Given the nature of Allah, Whatever points directly to him and to his character is by necessity a mystery and meaningless to man. It is for this reason that Islam has nothing comparable to the Christian concept of the knowledge of God. The spiritual advice to a devout Muslim is to develop an awareness of Allah, a constant remembrance of Allah's constant presence with him, presence which is unseen, unqualified, undefined, which is neither helpful nor encouraging, nor in any possible way reassuring. Allah is like an Orwellian big brother, distant and impersonal when it comes to relationship, but close and implacable when it comes to judgment. He can't be addressed in any possible way as a person, nor can he be known in any possible aspect or face or form. Identification with Allah or the indwelling of Allah are impossible. They will presuppose that either Allah is demoted from his divine status, or that man has been elevated to it. There is nothing concrete or active about such awareness. It remains passive and mystical, like parallel thought, active initiative to meet, know, and accept Allah in a process of sanctification is impossible in Islam. At best, there is passive contemplation of, of Allah's greatness, greatness which has nothing in it that man could relate to, and the contemplation brings no knowledge of anything that the character of Allah can contribute to man's sanctification or justification. Thus, in Christianity, man faces a God who is personal and therefore knowable at every level, and in both realms, divine and human, heaven and earth. In Islam, man faces Allah, whose personhood and character can't cross the central line and be revealed to man. For all practical purposes, from man's perspective, Allah is as impersonal and irrelevant as the God of deism. A creator who can't communicate meaningfully to his creation and therefore leaves men to figure out for themselves the issues of moral character and personhood. This concludes Part 1. Part 2. Putting the claim that theonomy is like Sharia to presuppositional rest by Bojidar Marinov, March 12th, 2015. From the nature of revelation to the nature of law. This so far was a long introduction to the issue of comparing the two legal systems, but it is unavoidable if our analysis is to be a thorough, presuppositional analysis. Unless we know the nature of the God of the system, and then the nature of his revelation, and have a cogent and coherent system of interpretation based on it, we won't be able to conduct a consistent analysis 
of any system of religion and thought. We will end up making absurd statements that only touch the surface, but never really give any knowledge. That White made the statement he made shows that he has never made such presuppositional analysis in the first place. He either doesn't know how to make it, or prefers base propaganda to thorough professional academic work. Had he made such an analysis, he would know that theonomy and sharia not only do not belong together, but they are actually polar opposites. And, in fact, it is his own anti-theonomy that is much closer to sharia, and that sharia is in fact consistently applied anti-theonomy with a vengeance. It would be obvious to him that the two systems, theonomy and sharia, having absolutely opposite presuppositions, will inevitably have absolutely opposite concepts of law, and therefore opposing legal systems. And in fact, given that anti-theonomy shares some presuppositional points with Sharia, they are much closer to each other. To push the antithesis at the beginning of the discussion on the law, a God who is both one and many, transcendent and imminent, who can and wills to deliver revelation that is perfectly representative of his character, Hebrews 1, 3, and yet perfectly meaningful to man, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, will deliver a radically different law from a God who is only unspecified and distant oneness, who can't be known to man, whose character remains hidden, and whose presence is only detected through mystical and vague awareness. Thus, while both deities will use revelation to give their respective covenant communities a system of ethical judicial rules, the two systems will have no fundamental resemblance to each other. On the surface, certain visible features may look similar. In reality, there won't be even basis for comparison. In our analysis now, I will include anti-theonomy as well, to make it clear which of the two teachings, theonomy or anti-theonomy, is closer to Sharia. Theonomy. The law is theocentric. As we said, the God of the Bible not only can represent his very character in terms meaningful and accessible to man, he also wills to do it. But the way the Bible starts its revelation of God, it presents him as primarily an ethical being, a being that is primarily concerned with the issue of good and evil. Now, of course, other aspects of knowledge and experience are also hidden and revealed in God. Beauty and harmony, rationality and logic, order and the cause and effect principle, etc. In the hidden nature of God, neither of these aspects is ultimate or primary. Such an idea would violate the principle of indivisibility and simplicity of God's being. But as far as the revealed nature of God is concerned, he chooses to reveal to man his ethical nature as foundational and defining for his covenant with man. God's assessment of his creation, it was good, indicating that ethics is the aspect through which God will communicate to man and through man will communicate back to God. Since man was created in God's image, this focus on the ethical aspect of God's nature speaks about the fundamental nature of man as well. Man is an ethical being too. The fundamental questions of his existence are not ontological, rationalistic, aesthetic, scientific, etc. They are ethical, questions of good and evil. Man's origins, existence, and future state will all hinge on how closely man conforms to the ethical nature of God. Everything else will be subject to it. The kingdom of God, the summum bonum of man's existence, will belong to men who are righteous and just, not to men who are smart logical, artistic, harmonious, powerful, mathematical, athletic, etc. This is the reason nothing excites man as issues of justice and righteousness. Wars are fought not over the artistic value of a painting or over the truthfulness of a mathematical formula, but over acts of perceived wickedness and injustice. Although I do remember times when teenagers would brawl over the perceived superiority of one style of popular music over another. Man's art and literature will always be concerned with moral issues. His scientific endeavors will be subject to moral commitments. His relationships will be defined by moral commitments, etc., etc. Man is an ethical creature, being in God's image, and therefore he needs God's moral nature revealed to him in its fullness, although not exhaustively. We should expect, then, 
that of all possible topics in the Bible, the topic of the law to be prominent and revealed in a most systematic, detailed, and practical way compared to all other topics. God is the great mathematician, but there is no systematic treatment of mathematics in the Bible. He is the great artist, but there is no textbook on art in the Bible. But God is an ethical being and the great judge, and the Bible contains the law of righteousness and justice of that judge in a systematic form. The foundational principles of ethics are stated in the two greatest commandments, Luke 10, 27, see Deuteronomy 6, 5, Leviticus 19, 18. Then they are broken into chapters, the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, 1 through 17, Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 21. Then case applications are developed to illustrate the principles of application, enforcement, and sanctions, Exodus 21 through Deuteronomy 34. Then, historical examples of ethical, judicial practice are presented in the historical and prophetic books of the Old Testament. And finally, the complete manifestation of God's moral character is presented in the New Testament, adding the application of the ethical judicial code to the New Covenant community. Since God has also chosen history to reveal Himself in it, we should expect the revelation of His character to contain certain measure of historical discontinuity such as to preserve the immutability of his moral character, and yet to present the dynamic history of his redemption. For this reason, the law would contain revelation both of his eternal character and of his temporal work. The temporal work will be revealed in the ceremonial laws and in the sundry, special, separate, set-apart, judicial laws, whose purpose is to give a temporary picture of God's future redemption. Thus, the law would reveal not only a God who is eternally an ethical being, transcendence, it would also reveal a God who is historically an active provider, immanence. Thus, when a theonomist studies the law to discover which parts of it are for specific time and place, and which parts are eternally valid, he always puts the law in the context of God's character, not in the context of time, place, or people. For every precept of the law he asks, quote, does this reveal God's moral character in eternity, or does this reveal his redemptive work in history? End quote. Only thus he decides which laws are still valid and which are changed. The law, then, is the full revelation in a systematic, knowable, searchable, and practically applicable form of God's moral character. To put it differently, it would reveal how God would act if he came down to earth and became a man. And guess what? He did come down to earth, and he did become a man, and he did perfectly obey the law. How was he capable of perfectly obeying the law? Well, it was his very character, that's how. But this applies not only to his personal walk, it applies to his judicial walk too. How would God act if he was an earthly king, or a judge, or a businessman, or a military leader? The law tells us about this as well. For Israel was supposed to be under God as king. And for this they had the law. In all respects, the law revealed God's character. It is for this reason that theonomists always start their analysis of every precept in the law with the assumption that the chief victim of every civil crime is God himself, and then look to the human victim. Thus murder and kidnapping and sodomy are crimes against God's image in man. Adultery and theft are crimes against God's order for society. False witness is a crime against God's judgment and justice, etc. The punishments, then, are punishments that reflect God as the chief victim, and therefore his interests are the first to be defended, as expressed in his law. Theonomy, thus, is always theocentric, that is, God-centered, when it comes to its concept of the law. The law is always viewed in the context of God. Its origins, its purpose, and its application always start with God, and his place in society. Every single part is related to God and his character, and his redemptive work in history. Theonomists do not take in account historical or humanitarian considerations when discussing the law. Neither do they judge the validity of the law by such considerations. To the contrary, they form their opinions about historical and humanitarian factors and case applications on the basis of the law. This is the most fundamental characteristic of theonomy. Anti-theonomy. The law is partially anthropocentric. Anti-theonomists, of course, 
share the same view of the origins of the law. There is no Christian who would deny that the law is the law of God, and it was given by God, and it is holy, righteous, and just. It is for this reason many of them resent when called antinomian. After all, they all have a, quote, high view of the law, end quote, right? The problem comes when the analysis moves from the origin of the law to the purpose and application of the law. It is there where the central disagreement and also the central misunderstanding with theonomy comes. As we saw above, when analyzing the specific parts of the law, the theonomist asks, quote, How does this specific part of the law relate to God and His character? Does it reveal God's ethical judicial character? What God would do if He was a man, a king, or a judge? Or does it reveal the historical dynamics of God's redemption before and after the cross? End quote. The theonomic analysis of the law is always God-centered and always assumes God as the point of reference. The question that laws are still valid in their direct meaning and what laws are fulfilled in Christ is resolved entirely based on the distinction between God's immutable character and God's redemptive work in history. When a theonomist sees discontinuity in the application of the law, that discontinuity is only revelatory. Christ hidden versus Christ revealed. Not ethical judicial, old justice versus new justice. Theonomy, thus, is theocentric at every step of its analysis of the law. The anti-theonomist, on the other hand, when discussing the specific parts of the law, always first asks the question, quote, To what group of men was this part of the law given? End quote. Based on that, then, assumptions are made as to whether this, the same part of the law would have been applicable to another group of men, or another generation of men, or another polity of men. Certain parts of the law, what is incorrectly called the civil code, are judged, then, to be applicable only to the group to which they were given, without any regard to what of God's character or historical work they represent. That applies when even to laws that are acknowledged to be judicial, pertaining to justice, issues of good and evil, not ceremonial, pertaining to issues of historical dynamics of revelation, of redemption. Thus, anti-theonomy's discontinuity is not simply old revelation versus new revelation. It is now old justice versus new justice. It's an ethical judicial discontinuity, and it is anthropocentric, centered on man, or groups of men, or cultures of men, or man's historical circumstances. It is for this reason the anti-theonomist seeks to modify certain judicial laws. They need to fit the modern humanistic concept of justice, as opposed to the biblical, revealed concept of justice, consistent with the revelation of God's ethical judicial character. God was a legitimate member of society only in the Old Testament Israel, and therefore his ideas of justice were fully applicable only there. Outside Israel, he is rather distant and detached, and his character is present in the justice system only in a vague, general way, as in general equity, for example by which anti-theonomists rather mean vague equity. Thus, the anti-theonomic view of justice is a dialectical mixture of two components. One, God's general moral principles in His law, which excludes His specific judicial applications. And two, man's specific judicial applications based on man's judgment of the demands of his situation. Man can use the specifics of the law of God, but is not obligated to do so being at liberty to change the rules where he sees fit. And, we need to add, since in this undertaking man loses the divine authority that goes with the law of God, his new practical system now needs another source of authority to establish itself. If the Bible, for example, declares double restitution as the proper judicial punishment for theft, and the anti-theonomist claims it is not obligatory, but a practical solution must be sought based on general equity, he must back his claim with some authority equal to the clear biblical text. The only available such authority is the authority of civil government, which has the additional benefit of being powerful enough to impose its sanctions over the biblical sanctions. Thus, Romans 13, 1-7 and 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14 are invoked to declare that authority as trumping God's law on the matter of justice, as opposed to the theonomic interpretation which sees in those verses a command to rulers to obey God's law. In the final account, by being anthropocentric, 
anti-theonomy by necessity becomes political and power-oriented. Islam. The law is entirely anthropocentric. As we saw, it comes to the na nature of revelation. Islam is, for all practical purposes, a deistic religion. It has a distant God who may have created the world, may be running the world, but is incapable of communicating to man a specific, practical, applicable revelation of his character. Knowing Allah is impossible. Asking to see Him is sin that requires repentance. The attempt to know Him leads to a loss of consciousness. Man, then, is left to his own devices to decide what ethics is and what justice is, with only minimal help from Allah. All deism eventually leads to some form of dualism in the area of ethics and justice, as expressed in the words of Montesquieu in his The Spirit of the Laws. Quote, we ought not to decide by divine laws what should be decided by human laws, nor determine by human what should be decided by divine laws. End quote. Islam is even more dualistic than the European classical deism, for it can't account for the origin of divine laws. What is a divine law for a Muslim? Does it represent the moral character of Allah? If so, it can't be known by men. Does it represent Allah's advice to men how to conduct themselves morally? If so, then it can't be more than general, vague moralism, for Allah can't cross the central line and full identify with man as the God of the Bible can. Hebrews 2.17 In fact, Muslim scholars point to the fact that Allah is insensitive. He can't even feel the emotions humans feel, and so he wouldn't be able to share in their indignation and revolt against injustice. We shouldn't expect, then, the Quran to contain anything close to the biblical law, a distinct body of fundamental ethical principles and systematic case application of them. There are no two greatest commandments in the Quran, no Ten Commandments, and nothing even close to the Law of Moses, let alone its prophetic applications. At best, the Quran can offer a vague collection of its isolated pieces of moralistic advice and a few isolated judicial rulings which can't be demonstrated to be related in any logical way to any consistent system of ethics. And in certain cases, those judicial rulings contradict each other. But what is called civil code is lacking. There isn't one. And given the nature of Allah, there can't be one. It is at this point where Sharia comes in, and its nature and purpose becomes clear. Sharia is not, and was not meant to be, a systematic, ethical, judicial system expressive of Allah's moral character. It is, and was meant to be, a haphazard patchwork to make up for the inherent dualism of the Quran's doctrine of ethics and justice. To claim authority, it has to be loosely based on the vague moral rules in the Qur'an. To be practical, it has to develop its specific judicial rules based on what is habitual, practical, specific to groups of people, or expedient in view of the agenda of the ruling class. And indeed, this is what Sharia is. It is a combination of one, general moral rules based on the Qur'an, with only a scant interest to the few judicial laws found in it, and two, the Sunnah a motley, disorganized collection of thousands of specific ethical and judicial pronouncements based on extra-Quranic human jurisprudence, or supposed sayings of Muhammad overheard by his contemporaries. To this, another element is often added, which is often overlooked by commentators, and it is, three, the customs and habits of the local tribes and communities which, even if not related to the Quran or to Muhammad, have been sanctified by time. Most of the time, human jurisprudence in the Sunnah overrules the teachings of the Qur'an based on issues of practicality, expediency, or tradition. An example would be the Sharia's view of punishment for male sodomy. Female sodomy is not considered a crime or sin in Islam, given that a sexual act is defined as penetration only. The Qur'an, while it has str some strong words to say against the people of Lut, Sodom and Gomorrah, doesn't prescribe death penalty for it in the only verse that speaks about illegal intercourse, which would include sodomy as well as adultery. In An-Nisa, quote, If two men among you are guilty of lewdness, punish them both. If they repent and amend, leave them alone. For Allah is oft returning most merciful. 4.16
end quote. No matter how we choose to interpret the word punish, and no matter how we choose to define the punishment, one thing is clear. The Quran is much softer on sodomy than the biblical law. For this reason, for most of the history of Islam, Islam jurisprudence has been reluctant to declare judicial punishment against sodomy. It wasn't until the 19th century, under the influence of Victorian England, that most Islamic societies introduced systematic legislation against sodomy. Thus, what the Holy Book says must be complemented and modified by human laws, which at times were less severe, and at times more severe, than the Quran, depending on the decisions and circumstances of men. Sharia, then, is fundamentally anthropocentric. It doesn't acknowledge Allah as a full-fledged member of the society in any meaningful way. Present, yes. A member, no. All civil disputes are between human beings. Islamic jurisprudence, very much like anti-theonomy, and contrary to theonomy, doesn't acknowledge Allah as a part, party of a civil suit. All civil suits are between humans. The above-mentioned punishment for sodomy is one example. Another example would be the Qur'an's punishment for murder. In Al-Baqarah, quote, O ye who believe, the law of equality is prescribed to you in cases of murder, the free for the free, the slave for the slave, the woman for the woman. But if any remission is made by the brother of the slain, then grant any reasonable demand and compensate him with handsome gratitude. This is a concession and a mercy from your Lord. After this, whoever exceeds the limits shall be in grave penalty. End quote. 2. 178. Notice the difference. In the Bible, murder is a crime against God's image, Genesis 9 6, and therefore there is no mercy for a murderer. For only God, as the true victim of the crime, can show mercy in the final judgment. But Allah has no image in man, and therefore he has no real participation in the society, and therefore he can't be a victim of a crime. The victims are always human, in this case, the relatives of the slain. So they are allowed to ask for money, and thus the murderer can avoid the kisas, equal retribution, and obtain mercy by play, paying them. Again, even in the case of murder, the Quran itself is anthropocentric. When we move to Sunnah's application of it, it becomes even more so. As we saw with anti-theonomy above, when a system is anthropocentric, it has to face the issue of legitimacy. By what authority? In the case of anti-theonomy, the authority used most frequently is the concept of natural law, often vague and undefined enough to include anything. But in the final analysis, power is transferred to the state, and Romans 13 is used to confer authority to tyrannical civil governments to apply any laws they decide. Islam, like anti-theonomy, does the same. Islamic jurisprudence has, and has always had, a rich natural law tradition. I won't go into detail about that tradition, but the readers can go to Professor Anver M. Iman's article, Natural Law and Natural Light Rights in Islamic Law, in Journal of Law and Religion, Volume 20, Number 2, 2004-2005, pages 351-395, to for a full treatment on the issue. But since natural law in itself doesn't bestow authority on interpreter of it. In the final account, Islam has to adopt a view of the state that makes it quasi-divine and fully authoritative in legislation and enforcement. Just like anti-theonomy, by being anthropocentric, Islam by necessity becomes political and power-oriented. To summarize the characteristics of the three systems when it comes to the law and the application of the law. Theonomy the law is fully encoded in the Bible. Moral principles and judicial case applications, and both the origin and the purpose of it, are centered on God, His character, and His work in history. All institutions are obligated to obey it, and an institution that doesn't obey it loses its legitimacy and can be legitimately opposed. Anti-theonomy The law is encoded in the Bible as moral principles but its judicial applications must be modified by human intervention, because while its origin is centered on God, its application is centered on man and his circumstances. The standards for modification must come from other sources, general equity, which, even if morally related to the Bible, are nevertheless different from it in the principles of application.
The civil government, then, as the most powerful institution, assumes the right to decide on the modifications. And it can't be legitimately opposed by Christians, even if it is outright tyrannical and unjust. Sharia The Qur'an contains no comprehensive system of ethics, personal or judicial. The origins of the law can't be centered on a law, because a law can't reveal his true ethical character to man. Therefore, the law must be man-centered, with man taking the initiative to make judicial laws based on general equity, expedience, natural law, etc. The civil government, as the most powerful institution, is uniquely capable of supplying the necessary authority for any law created by man on the vague moral principles of the Islamic religion. Therefore, opposing the authorities is opposing Allah. Had James White made the effort to do such a thorough presuppositional analysis of Islam and theonomy, he would have clearly seen that of the two systems, theonomy and anti-theonomy, it is anti-theonomy that is much closer to Sharia, Sharia is, in fact, anti-theonomy taken to its logical conclusion. Even the thought of comparing theonomy to Sharia shows that White's knowledge of presuppositionalism is, at best, at a high school textbook level. Or, if he knows presuppositionalism, he has decided to not use it. Or he simply doesn't understand theonomy and speaks about what he has no clue of. Or, to cover all possibilities, he is simply dishonest. I'll let the reader take his pick. Acts 15 and Islam What is even more distressing, though, are White's claims to be an expert on Islam, compared to his claim that, quote, Islam doesn't have Acts 15, but we do, end quote. It is here where it becomes clear that even if he has learned a lot of data and facts, he is clearly short of understanding of Islam as it is. For an audience that is generally less familiar with Islam, his claims may have somewhat damaging effect given that many of his listeners would trust him on that issue and maybe even engage their Muslim friends with such an outright nonsense. While this particular topic is not directly part of the presuppositional discussion above, I will use the opportunity to correct his lack of understanding. That he is misapplying Acts 15 when relating it to theonomy is clear enough, and it has been pointed out by others. Sufficient to say that while Acts 15 indeed indicates certain discontinuity in the legal system, and applications of the Bible, it has nothing to do with the topic of the debate with theonomy, namely, the judicial laws. The discontinuity it covers is the one mentioned above, in the application of the ceremonial laws, the shadows which were used in the Old Testament to reveal the future Christ. Theonomy doesn't include any teaching that would keep the ceremonial laws obligatory. If White is using Acts 15 as a whip against theonomy, then he either doesn't understand Acts 15, or he doesn't understand theonomy or, to cover all possibilities, he is dishonest in his criticism. But let's turn to that part of his statement that concerns Islam. It is true enough that Acts 15 still speaks about some discontinuity. If taken in its most honest meaning, White's statement would mean that Islam doesn't believe in any kind of discontinuity, that there is full continuity between Islam and an older covenant, which in his view would place Islam closer to theonomy than to anti-theonomy. Nothing could be further from the truth. Our analysis here needs to start with the fact that Quran views itself as the last of several words of revelation in history. The previous revealed words are the Taurat, the Hebrew Torah, the Zabur, the Psalms of David, possibly also the prophetic books of the Old Testament, and the Injil, the Gospel of Jesus. Thus, while the Quran claims to be the perfect, unadulterated revelation, as opposed to the earlier ones, which have been supposedly changed over time, it is still only a continuation from previous revelations and covenants, an heir to their religion. If we take the Christian division of Old and New Testament, the Quran thus claims for itself the status of a newer New Testament. This is an important fact to our discussion here, for while the Quran claims revelational continuity, in reality, its view of discontinuity is much stronger, and this view is summarized in the Islamic doctrine of abrogation. Abrogation of previous revelations is a fundamental doctrine in, is in Islam, and it will take another article like this one to explain to Christian readers the full meaning of it. It is related to many other topics and doctrines in Islam, like Allah's unknowability and oneness, the nature of prophetic revelation, the nature of the faith and testimony, etc., 
for our purposes here, I will only mention a few points. First, the Quran itself, in Ali Imran, acknowledges that in the Injil, Jesus did come to at least modify the law in terms of its requirements to those who believe. Quote, And make him a messenger to the children of Israel, who will say, Indeed, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, and that I design for you from clay, that which is, like the form of a bird. Then I breathe into it, and it becomes a bird by permission of Allah. And I cure the blind and the leper, and I give life to the dead by permission of Allah. And I inform you of what you eat and what you store in your houses. Indeed, in that is a sign for you, if you are believers. And I have come confirming what was before me of the Torah, and to make lawful for you some of what was forbidden to you. And I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, so fear Allah and obey me. 3, 49-50 End quote. There's your Acts 15 mentioned and confirmed in the Quran. Given that the doctrine of abrogation is an important Islamic doctrine, an educated Muslim should know that Jesus did bring a discontinuity in the law and did abrogate certain requirements of the law. In addition to it, we have then a discontinuity between previous revelations and the revelation brought by Muhammad. The Quran speaks in Al-Baqarah about previous revelations abrogated. Quote, Neither those who disbelieve from the people of the scripture nor the polytheists wish that any good should be sent down to you from your Lord. But Allah selects for his mercy whom he wills, and Allah is the possessor of great bounty. We do not abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten except that we bring forth one better than it or similar to it. Do you not know that Allah is over all things competent? 2, 105 and 106. End quote. There's your Acts 15 applied to the Quran itself in re relation to previous revelations. A Muslim doesn't have to be proficient in the Quran to know that much. This should be enough for the average Christian to conclude that James White doesn't know what he is talking about. But the Islamic doctrine of abrogation doesn't stop there. Prepare for the real surprise. The Islamic doctrine of abrogation applies to discontinuities within the Quran itself. Yes, you read that right. The Quran contains certain verses which abrogate other verses of the very Quran itself. And the very Quran, in An-Nal, defends this as a testimony to the sovereignty of Allah without giving the reason for such abrogation. Quote, and when we substitute a verse in place of a verse, and Allah is most knowing of what he said, sends down, they say, You, O Muhammad, are but an inventor of lies, but most of them do not know. 16.101 End quote. So not only does the Quran have Acts 15 in relation to previous revelations, it has Acts 15 in relation to itself. And this is not some trivial small problem which has no bearing on the Islamic religion. To the contrary, a significant part of Muslim religious studies is devoted to deciding which verses in the Qur'an are abrogated by other verses. The discontinuity is within the Qur'an itself. And it doesn't stop there. The abrogation continues with the Hadith, that is, the post-Qur'an stories of the life of Muhammad. The Hadith is believed to contain sayings which legitimately abrogate verses of the Qur'an itself. There is no agreement as to what abrogates what. The only real agreement between Islamic Muslim scholars is that the doctrine of abrogation must be applied across the board to everything. On the surface, it seems that Islam is a religion of unified, consistent, fixed religious truths. In reality, it is nothing more than situational ethics, or worse, a religion where today's emotions of man can abrogate all the moral principles stated yesterday. James White is incorrect. Islam in fact, is a gigantic, twisted version of Acts 15. It has no secure, predictable continuity at any level of its revelation. It's all discontinuity from beginning to end. Again, Islam is not even close to theonomy. To the contrary, it is a consistent anti-theonomic system. Anti-theonomy taken to its logical end. Conclusion A Christian teacher exhibits irresponsible behavior when he simply throws around arbitrary and shallow statements without doing his homework to establish their truthfulness and validity. He is also dangerous to the souls and minds of those of his listeners who trust him. He is betraying that trust. Quote, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, 
knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment, end quote, James 3, 1. Teaching others is a calling that is special. It carries special trust, and no Christian teacher should allow himself the liberty to violate that trust. It applies even more to those teachers who claim to be presuppositional, that is, tell their listeners that they develop their thinking by examining the religious presuppositions behind any system they analyze. And it applies even more to those who claim some expertise in a certain field. It is obvious that James White hasn't done his presuppositional homework in comparing theonomy to Sharia. Had he done it, he would see that his comparison was not only incorrect, but also dishonest. Because, in reality, it is White's own anti-theonomy that is like Sharia in its religious presuppositions. The analysis must start by looking at the nature of the two sovereigns, God and Allah. The former is a trinity, both one and many, transcendent and imminent. The latter is ultimate oneness and transcendence, detached from his world, unable to enter it as a person. God, therefore, can deliver a detailed, valid, applicable, meaningful message to the world by simply entering it and taking on the body of a human being. His word is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the imprint of God in the world. Knowledge of God is not only possible. It must be desired by men, and lacking such knowledge is a sign of the unbelievers. Allah can't reveal himself in any positive and meaningful way, for by doing so, he will either have to descend to human level or elevate humans to divine level. Men can relate to Allah only through an awareness of his presence. Knowledge is impossible, and the request for knowing Allah is sinful, and ultimately leads to destruction of matter or conscience. The law systems will be radically different, therefore. Since God reveals himself fully, though not comprehensively, we should expect that in his law he will reveal his moral character, how God would act in all situations if he was a man. Thus, we should expect his law to be complete and functional without having to resort to outside sources or human legislation. Theonomy takes this principle seriously and sees in the law of God a sufficient basis for justice which only needs faithful application, not changes. It interprets the law of God in the framework of God's character and work in history. Anti-theonomy interprets the law of God against historical and cultural backdrops and looks for extra-biblical sources for complementing the law's system of justice for our times, while the biblical revelation of the law is used only for moral instruction. Allah is not able to deliver such a systematic and full law. There is nothing that such a law would reveal about Allah. Therefore, the law in the Qur'an is a fragmented mess of isolated moralisms and a few judicial statements without any solid, fundamental principles behind them. In the final account, Islam needs human traditions and decisions to build its system of law. Its system, therefore, is similar to that of anti-theonomy, moral instruction from the book, judicial laws from general equity or natural law. In the final account, both anti-theonomy and Islam resort to giving more power to the state as the only institution that can back their law systems with sufficient power and authority. Therefore, it is not theonomy that is like Sharia. Presuppositionally, Sharia is consistent, anti-theonomy taken to its logical end. So let's put the ignorant claim that theonomy is like Sharia to its presuppositional rest. Our honesty and our responsibility as teachers demand this of us. This concludes the audio article Putting the Claim that Theonomy is like Sharia to Presuppositional Rest by Bojidar Marinoff. About Bojidar Marinoff, a reformed missionary to his native Bulgaria for over ten years, Bojidar preaches and teaches doctrines of the Reformation and a comprehensive biblical worldview. Having founded Bulgarian Reformation Ministries in 2001, he and his team have translated over 30,000 pages of Christian literature about the application of the law of God in every area of man's life and society and published those translations online for free. He has been active in the formation of the Libertarian Movement in Bulgaria, a co-founder of the Bulgarian Society for Individual Liberty, and its first chairman. If you would like Bojidar to speak to your church, homeschool group, or other organization, contact him through his website www.bulgarianreformation.com This has been a Reconstructionist Radio production, narrated by Jason Sanchez. 
please visit our website, reconstructionistradio.com, for free audiobooks and audio articles.